here's our, our faculty disclosure. Um, we do not have any relevant financial relationships with any of uh, uh, commercial interests. Um, we're go again, my name is Kelly Wasco. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today, again, with our emphasis being on population and mostly focusing on what some of the issues and concerns are as it relates to correctional management, as well as the transition process of getting the aging population out of the correctional industry and back into um, um, into society and how we do that, how that's affected by not only the community issues and concerns, nursing home placements, special needs parole, um, compassionate releases. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but we'll kind of go over some of the educational ob objectives, some of the challenges that we face in managing these offenders in the uh, in the correctional environment. How many of you actually have specialized programs for geriatric offenders in your states? Okay. And, and of the couple that raised their hands, do you have facilities that are specific to only those that are disabled or geriatric by an age? No. Okay. Okay. Okay, how about an actual institution that's designated for, that's the mission of the institution? Do we have anybody that's got anything like that? An institution, an actual institution that is designated for any kind of offenders with disabilities, um, geriatric, long-term care, any of those kind of things? Okay. Anybody who used to? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all of Colorado puts okay. their hand up. Okay. We'll talk about that a little yeah. bit. Um, probably one of the greatest things that we did and, and one of the hardest things we undid was, was having a 500-bed uh, facility that was actually designated strictly for the geriatric and the disabled offenders. And of course, that all comes from, from budget restrictions. But we'll talk a little bit about it, the benefits it did for our state, as well as some of the hindrances that came simply because of geographical location and um, the, you know, the distance between the closest hospital and um, the mission of that facility. So we're also going to evaluate controversial questions that address human rights of the older offenders. How do we deal with some of the, the human rights um, um, components and how do we address meeting the needs of the offenders so that we're meeting those human rights uh, requirements while they're within incarceration. And again, that goes back to the, the management. We're going to talk a little bit about the management of the offenders and how we meet all of the, again, the ADA, American Disabilities Act also the, um, the Human Rights Act, as well as meeting the incarceration through statutory requirements. And then we'll compare and contrast possible solutions. We're going to each take an, an active role in making sure that, um, that some of the solutions that we talk about are, as you all know, there's a fiscal responsibility as well as a, a constitutional responsibility to make sure that these offenders are managed effectively. So since uh, I'm, I represent the research department at the Colorado Department of Corrections, so of course we have to throw out some statistics today. I brought my aging presenter reading glasses with me. These are not just a prop for effect. I actually need these. Uh, but the, uh, the, the part of this that, of course, many of us find deeply disturbing is that in the correctional environment, we consider 50 and older elderly. So I'm still trying to get a handle on that one. Uh, which, <laughs> find really unsettling, but, uh, but that is what it is. So, so we do consider 50 and over in the correctional environment are, are older inmates, and it probably comes as no surprise that these are the fastest growing, this is the fastest growing segment of the prison population. It rather mirrors what we see in the general population overall, and there are several reasons for this. Um, the baby boomers are getting older, so they're a huge segment of our general population, and I mean uh, outside of the correctional environment, but also in prisons as well. Um, the get tough on crime laws, the three strikes laws, the harsher sentences, those have also led to a growing aging population. And in some states, uh, parole has been abolished, and that's been another factor in all of this. So just to um, add a few more statistics, and uh, I promise we won't bore you too much with um, all of this just up front. Between uh, 1995 and 2010, the number of state and federal prisoners aged 55 and over nearly quadrupled. So that was an increase of almost seven times the rate of the general population. I mean, that's gigantic. Uh, you may have seen a report that Human Rights Watch came out with called uh, Older Behind Bars, which went into a, a great detail on this topic. 
At the end of 2010, 8% of state and federal inmates were 55 or older compared to only 3% in 1995. So just to take another look at this whole population trend, um, this slide compares the, the total inmate population with the aging offender population of 55 and older in this case, and you can see how dramatically different that even though the, the total population uh, was dipping just a little bit in 2010, the 55 and older population continues to increase dramatically. And in Colorado, of course, we're seeing the same thing, that um, over the last couple of years, and um, the trend looks like we're seeing a continuing decline of our overall prison population, but not so for the 50 and older population that's continuing to increase. Um, so in 2011, inmates 50 and over accounted for 9% of Colorado admissions, and that compares to only 4% in 1991. So as I said, our, um, our prison population is actually continuing to decline just a little bit, but the aging offender population has grown. Um, as of January, the end of January of this year, it was 10% of admissions. Um, some of the literature on aging offenders uh, categorizes these offenders into, into kind of di different buckets, different, different groups um, that, you know, may or may not be useful. But, um, but there's the first time elderly, 67% um, of those um, are in our Colorado Department of Corrections. Uh, chronic offenders, those are offenders that have been incarcerated for three or more times. They account for 17% of our aging population. Um, the lifers or the old timers, um, those are 23%, the ones that have just been in there forever. And short term offenders who have been incarcerated in their middle years, and we consider that um, 35 to 49 years old, and that's 9% of the population. Um, so you, this, this chart represents the uh, most serious offenses by age group who's committing the more serious offenses, the class one, two, and three felonies. Um, older inmates are more likely to be incarcerated for these more serious felonies than younger inmates. Um, but this relative proportion of older inmates that commit um, homicides, kidnapping, sexual assault, it's larger in this 50 and over age group because they, of course, got longer sentences for these more serious crimes. So don't let these statistics mislead you because overall, the segment of adults 50 and over, they actually have the lowest crime rate of, of any age group in the uh, offending population. So um, older offenders tend to be classified at lower custody levels and if they commit rule infractions, you know, violations while they're in prison, they tend to be much more minor violations than the younger folks. So, you know, they, you just kind of run out of steam as you get older. And then, <laughs> you just don't have the energy to really act up anymore. <laughs> as Laura said, um, the, the age range for what different jurisdictions consider elderly um, does range anywhere from 50 to 70. Um, we've had lots of debate about that in Colorado. Um, I'm sure most of you are aware that our executive director um, was actually murdered about a month ago. And last year, he, uh, he, he put this, incorporated this issue into our department's strategic plan. And so, um, and I actually was um, asked by him to, um, to lead that group, and so I, I wasn't sure if it was because I qualified um, by, the, by the age that Colorado, but I, I used to tell him that that was just kind of jacked up that it was 50, but it is. Um, the interesting thing is that there, there really doesn't appear to be a standard for if it's 50, 55, 65, or 70, but, but that's kind of the range that, that we're looking at. And like I said, Colorado, um, it is 50. And this is, this is pretty interesting, and I'm sure all of us can relate to this. You know, you'll, you'll see an offender um, that's incarcerated that's 50, and more often than not, that offender looks like he's at least 60, maybe 65 or 70. And there's, there's a lot of factors that contribute to that, um, and most of it has to do with their lifestyle. Um, for the most part, a lot of them are substance abusers. 
um, did not take good care of their health um, prior to being incarcerated. As a matter of fact, a lot of times, most of them get the best health care they've ever had in their lives while they're incarcerated. Um, the, the, just the stress of incarceration can add to that, but um, I always think it's interesting how, how much older um, folks look and physiologically are when they're incarcerated. The overlapping populations, um, you know, I'll just mention that, that my facility um, is Colorado Territorial Correctional Facility, and we mentioned that Colorado used to have a facility that was dedicated to the aging offender population, and when it closed, the, the biggest um, proportion of those offenders came to Territorial, and so we can really relate to this. Um, the, the conditions that overlap quite frequently are, are their age, um, the fact that they are elderly. Um, they could have um, some chronic um, conditions um, based, based on their, their um, health. And then some of them can actually also um, have terminal conditions. You know, they, maybe they have cancer or something like that. And so, so that's a challenge, too, um, in addition to everything else that we attempt to do to manage those offenders, trying to deal with those three overlapping conditions. Medical disorders. Although not uncommon nationally, it's not something that's significant to corrections, is the fact of those chronic medical disorders. And the common arthritis, hypertension, ulcers, prostate problems, heart disease, diabetes. Um, although they're not uncommon to us as a nation, when you look at those that are incarcerated, most of them have either had poor health care or a lack of participation in health care, which exacerbates how they are when they come into the correctional environment. And this makes them more difficult to manage because they're going to have a lot of the secondary, um, the renal problems from, from diabetics, dementia, GI disorders, bleeding disorders, and then ongoing with, the, with the, um, um, the cancers, the higher risk of cancers, respiratory conditions. When you start to exacerbate this elderly population with these medical conditions, which could otherwise be managed, you think about what is the one thing that is completely intact when they come into a correctional environment? What do we give them still absolute control of? Their, their, their patient rights. They have absolute control of their patient rights. They, can, they still have a right to refuse care. They still have a right to refuse medications. They have a right to refuse diagnostics. And that's the one piece of control that they still have. Um, I don't know how some of you have um, canteens or commissaries. In, in your correctional environments. In ours, diabetic or not, if somebody wants to buy a box of Ho-Ho's and eat them in 15 minutes, simply because they're diabetic, type one, type two, doesn't matter if they're an exacerbated, controlled hemoglobin A1C of 13, it doesn't matter. They have a right to order Ho-Ho's and eat Ho-Ho's in any quantity or, that they want. It's, it's part of, their, it's part of their, their patient rights. And when they have that, that bit of control, they're going to exercise it to, to the end. That makes it more difficult for us to manage. And, and I'm sure that you, when you have a diabetic that comes in, or if you have uh, somebody who's got hypertension, morbid obesity, and you pull their, how many of you have done this, where you've seen a patient and you pull their, their canteen list? Oh, I'm telling you, I still do it. I'm not in direct patient care. And I'll say, let me see what this guy is eating. He's got a hemoglobin A1C of 10.8, and he buys more sugar in one week than I buy in an entire month when I had four kids living at home. So, but there's, you know, there, you can bring it up to them. It's a patient awareness. It's a teaching. It's an educational moment. But it's not anything we can do because it's their right, and it's the one bit of control that they have. It just makes it more difficult for us to manage them because it exacerbates whatever their diagnosis is. Um, here's a little, 47% of Colorado inmates 50 and over have significant medical needs compared to 23% of our inmates that are less than 50. What do you, what do you think some of the precipitating factors are in that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and looking at, I mean, it's a different generation. It's a different generation. We're talking about two different um, generational makeups. And there's very different formative years. And some of our older convicts, you know, that are over 50, 
um, by gosh, you know what, you think about that baby boomer generation or the veterans generation, and, and you know what, this is the way I want to do it, nobody's going to change my mind. Whereas you have some of your younger generations that are a little bit more um, able to have their formative thoughts manipulated by, by professionals. So you, you see an obvious 47% um, over age 50 that are having those significant issues compared to those that are, that are under 50. And you're talking about offenders, correct? That's correct. Okay. That would be correct. Just checking. Just checking, Cal. She, she <laughs> likes the fact that we're weebling right around that 50. You know, one of us is past it, one of us is just under it. And so she constantly does that and makes sure that we have the balance of we know who's on each side. Exactly right. Okay. <laughs> Um, some of the challenges. Okay, so additional costs for medical care and associated needs, the transportation, assistive devices. Um, you know, if you really think about in the industry, I mean, and, and, and how many of you are, even have a tiny iota? You don't, you don't have to know the top drop dead number, but how many of you have a tiny iota of how much durable medical equipment and healthcare appliances cost your organization? I see people do this. They do this. They're like, I don't want anybody to know that I'm answering this question. Um, you think about it. Though that's just one tiny cost. But what, what is one of probably the bigger associated costs with people who have unmanaged, unstable chronic illnesses? Hospitalizations, Hospitalizations and back the truck up. How do they get to the hospital? Transfer. Through the emergency room. So you think of those emergency room visits, those ambulance visits, those um, flight for life uh, medical costs. You think of all of these building costs that build up to that hospitalization, which then becomes a catastrophic expense, and 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 it and it just it just builds and builds and builds, and then they come back to your facility and they have this ongoing specialty need. They need to be going to the oncologist. They need to be going to the nephrologist. They have to be going to see um, uh, specialists. Uh, we can go on and on and on. The ophthalmologist, the optometrist. Um, but those costs, they start, to, they start to build, and that becomes a huge problem, especially in the, in the management. Um, ADA environments. How many of you have had even a grievance, let alone a lawsuit, related to ADA requirements? Oh, my goodness. It's, um, for those of you that are familiar with Colorado, we had a, a 10 and a half year lawsuit. And we actually went into monitoring phase this last year. We were very excited for uh, significant compliance that led, allowed us to go into a monitoring phase. But what that stemmed from was, you know, do we have the appropriate handrails that are by the American Disabilities Guidelines? Do we have toilets at the right seat? Do our cells, you know, many of us go by ACA and NCCHC uh, square footage for a cell, but are we really looking at you know, do you remember the old, I mean, I can remember 16 years ago in corrections where if they could go in, a nurse used to stand at the cell door and say, okay, turn your wheelchair around. Yep, you're making it. Just squeeze a little on the right. <laughs> yep, you can make it. Suck it in. Um, and it was good to go, right? That was a wheelchair cell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not so much. Um, you have that minimum square footage that's unobstructed ability to move around a cell. And those are things that are, that are starting to come down and organizations are starting to look closely at. The Colorado Department of Corrections actually went around the state, identified cells that were modified, and we have X amount of mobility cells throughout the state. We have X amount of cells that have um, um, all of the assistive devices for those that are hearing impaired, visually impaired. All of these cells that meet all of the ADA requirements for the different kind of disabilities that we could encounter. So again, here comes this, you know, the challenges, the management challenges that we're having. Um, increased mental health needs. Do you guys have anybody that has a couple mental health? Um, that is that not a, a very um, prominent trend right now in corrections? It's a huge prominent trend in corrections be it something that it's a pre-existing condition, something that they're coming into corrections for, or they're having some of those institutional anxieties, some of those um, symptoms that as they come into the organization, we still have an, op an obligation that we have to provide care to them. And what that's doing is it's starting to show a little bit more of a change in the balance of how many professionals do we need to have from the mental health world, the behavioral health world, your sex offender, drug and alcohol, uh, general mental health, that can balance those mental health or behavioral health needs. 
um, and managing housing assignments. What are some of the, the biggest issues with our, our graying, much older than 50, um, <laughs> offenders in housing? CPAPs. What exactly? What else? What are some of those things, those huge issues we're finding with housing these folks? Um, at my facility, we're having issues with lower bunk, lower tier restrictions. Lower oh, bunk, lower tier. Gosh, you only have yes. so many. Right. You only have so many. I, I, I can't tell you. When I was the warden, we're going to talk a little bit about the Fort Lyon Correctional Facility, and I was the warden there. Um, Ten years ago, Ray and I were the majors there. I was over the health services, and Ray was over custody control, and Ten years later, I mean, we we're like, holy cow, you know, how did we end up with, with um, evolving through being wardens of the geriatric facilities? We should have taken a hint back then when we were both <laughs> under 50. Um, good point. <laughs> good point. Um, yeah. I'm surprised you gave me credit for that. Yeah. Um, but, but again, you, you only have so many bottom bunks, bottom tiers, and I can remember Ray coming into my office and saying, you know what, we're running out of bottom bunks and bottom tiers. And I said, well, then quit sending old people here. <laughs> if we would quit sending the geriatric offenders here or we just we took out all the bunk beds and made everything single layer, we would be okay. But you're absolutely right. And there's and, only so much wheelchair space. We're right. dealing with that right exactly. now. Exactly. Yeah. What's some other ones? What are some other inhibitions with putting people in cell houses? Offender care aids. In Colorado, we have, we have offender care aids. You know, some offenders, I mean, you know, you have your different, different levels of assistance. Some can get themselves dressed and feed themselves, but they're not quite stable enough to safely transfer from the chair to the toilet or the toilet to the chair. Um, but then you have others that, you know what, once they get, have you ever seen that offender that flops into bed and he's still like that 11 hours later? You know, and we wonder why they have stage 3D cubes on their hips and their butts and their, you know, the, their bony prominences. What's another one? There was one back there. Right. Exactly. What about what about dementias? Housing dementias. Or or better yet, and this one tricks those poor correctional officers, and we're gonna talk a little bit about how do we get past this, especially if you don't have a designated pod or a designated facility. Sundowners. Somebody who at 9 o'clock in the morning is a rocket scientist. At 6 o'clock at night, they're at the front door thinking they can just clock out and go home with you because that sundowner's effect. And correctional officers are saying, you're so stupid. Don't you see he's playing you? And we have to teach them, this is sundowners. This is what sundowners looks like. This is somebody starting into that dementia phase. But that poses those problems in housing. And all those offenders are victim prone. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's a huge issue out in general population. Absolutely. And then one of the bigger plans or, or bigger issues, you know, when you're housing these people is how do you prepare these kind of people in these difficult housing assignments? How do you pre prepare them for parole? What can you do to prepare them for parole when you can barely manage their incarcerated living environment? You're barely able to manage their incarcerated living environment. How do you prepare those people for parole? We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, preventing victimization, which Ray was just talking about. Um, obviously, you know, when, when we lived, when we lived, when we lived at Fort Lyon. Um, <laughs> Felt like it, huh? <laughs> I know it did. When we were at Fort Lyon, we had an inpatient unit. It was 48 beds, and it was like a nursing home. It was our, it was our inpatient unit. All of our offenders had needed constant 24-hour care, meds brought to them, turned every two hours. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. I mean, what happens when you get somebody who family won't take them? So you can't do a compassionate parole. You can't do a compassionate release. You can't do a special needs parole because a nursing home's not going to take them. He's 77 years old. He's contracted. He's laying in a bed. He's not going to hurt anybody, but he has sex offender label. Is a sex offender label. And guess what? And, and I had many nursing home administrators say, we have a promise to everybody in this nursing home, we will not put anybody in here that has any kind of felony of a sex offense. He's contracted, rolled up in a ball. He's not going to get out of that bed. It doesn't matter. We have a promise to our constituents who are paying for beds for their loved ones. I get it. I get it. I completely get it. But what do I do with him? Ray and I had one. Um, 
in uh, 2004, I believe it was, 2004, 2005, and, and he was just that. He was a sex offender. He was in his late 70s. He was rolled up in a ball. He was turned every two hours, every two hours, back and forth. He had a feeding tube, um, could not parole him. His family wouldn't take him. His sex assault was against his grandchildren, so the family swore him off. Um, couldn't get him into a nursing home. And, but he had, he had a benefits check that went into his, his inmate account every month. But he was buying like $70 worth of canteen every two weeks. And we could not for the life of us figure out how this man who had to be turned every two hours was completely contracted, had no teeth, was ordering peanuts, ho-hos, um, popcorn. And what it turned out was the offenders, the other offenders in the unit were filling out his canteen slips yeah. for him. And when his canteen got delivered, they were helping him. That's exactly what they told us. Yeah. We were helping him get rid of his canteen. But he didn't know they were ordering it. And that's a clear sign of victimization. An obvious clear sign of victimization. In addition to some of the other, obviously, the, the um, sexual gratification things that happen with some of our elderly, as well as, you know, sometimes control. Simple control. Doesn't matter if it's an 80-year-old guy who can't defend himself. Sometimes some of our the criminology of some of our offender population is that, that you know what, just to be able to punch a human being and have that control over them, and there's your, there lies your other victimization. It's, it's actually kind of pathetic. I mean, we've actually, some of our OCAs, our offender care aides, have gotten the job just so that they could use the guy's wheelchair, you know, to, to mule their drugs and other contraband around yep. the facility. It's, we have three levels of OCAs in the state of Colorado and they go through very distinct training. We have an OCA level one, and that's just that guy that can get around, he can do everything himself. He can feed himself, dress himself, move around. He's great in his cell. But to make it to, to the chow hall, to make it to the library, to make it to, to he needs somebody to push him. Carry his tray from yeah. there. So we have OCA ones, which go through a very short training and they do no patient assistance at all. All they do is get the inmate from point A to point B and they do minimal for them. That's an OCA level one. Then we have an OCA level two, and that is that assistive person, okay? Um, you need help setting up your, your clothes for the day. You need help getting from the toilet to the, to the, uh, the bed back getting and forth. Dressed. Just that standby assist. And they go through specialized training Kathy, is it two days for OCA 2s? Two days for OCA 2s. Do you have a copy of that training? We can send it to you. We'd be, we'd be happy to send it to you. Um, and our, my email address is on the very last page of your handout, and you're welcome to contact us, and I'll, I'll put you in touch with the right people. And some of them are in the room. Right Absolutely. Now. So, and then your OCA 3s are, are really your total care. They're going to work more with the people that need to be turned every two hours. They learn, they learn how to do everything, excluding any kind of medical intervention. They don't take vital signs. They have nothing to do with patient health care. They do all of the total care, kind of like a CNA minus, um, you know, the, the, the vital signs, anything having to do with any kind of reportable diagnostics on the offender. They feed offenders. They learn, and it's, that's a five-day class. That's a week-long class. So, and we actually scaled that off of an accredited college CNA course. We used a lot of the same literature in developing that lesson plan. Um, Kathy has a master's in education, and she actually is the developer for the OCA levels one, two, and three for the state of Colorado. Um, and I will tell you, it, we've shared it with, with um, other disciplines, and it's actually working. So we'd, we'd be actually happy to help you in, in in scaling that and then there's you know that's just one piece of it the other piece of it is who who are you going to allow there's there's so many crimes that we don't allow to participate in this program um, there's certain types of behaviors time that you have to be without charges um, so but we can kind of go over those things and if anybody else would like some of that information you're welcome to get in contact with us and we'll make it available for and, you And too. that's one of the biggest challenges is finding folks that meet the criteria and then also trying to sift through their motivation um, because they can't, you know, so much of what we do now is based on um, re-entry, you know, mm -hmm. skills they can use on re-entry. And these folks can't 
go into any kind of health care because they're convicted felons once they get out. So, so that's a challenge. So training for correctional officers beyond ADA. So some of the things that, that we've worked very hard to do is the development of training in various areas. Everything from everybody thinks that, oh my goodness, that's a wheelchair, that's a, a, a blind stick, that's a walker, that, those are crutches, Canadian crutches, we can't touch them. You know what, buddy? Shake them down. Shake them down because the criminality is still there. Just because they're old doesn't mean that they don't have that criminality. So we go through teaching, teaching our correctional staff how to do appropriate shakedowns and what parts of, of, of uh, DME they actually, durable medical equipment, they actually need to have a clinical person there. Um, also, one of the things I want to kind of put some thoughts in your head is um, how do you teach people, especially when you have demented offenders, sundowners offenders, we all know, you know what, if, if I point them to go this way and they don't want to go this way, what's the first thing they're going to do? Yeah. Yeah. You know, are you going to do a use of force? How do you teach your correctional staff that this is a normal response for this diagnosis? Huntington's Korea. Eight years ago, I got a call at 2 o'clock in the morning. They said, this guy's crazy. He's beating everybody up. I said, what guy? And they said, you know, inmate so-and-so. I said, well, what do you mean he's beating everybody up? And they said, well, he's just flailing and he's going nuts. I said, he has Huntington's Korea. He can't help it. You know what? Make him safe. And so there's those diagnoses that we have to actually train people and, tr and teach people. If somebody flings, flicks you, or if a dementia patient is being redirected and they, they knock your hand away, we've all been conditioned. If you flick a pill cup at me, that's assault. But guess what? Assault looks a whole lot different when you're dealing with the aging populations, the demented, the sundowners, the Huntington's Korea, people who are her, her end stage uh, cancer, what's the first thing that goes? Mentation. So it's an education for our correctional officers. And we talked about this a little bit yesterday morning in our round table. Um, my, my background is in operations. I was a correctional officer for 18 years. And so as the facility I'm at a year ago got these offenders that, that were in a dedicated facility and, and they were brought into our general population the same time that Colorado was reducing its ad seg population and we were getting some of those offenders, you know, my, it, it was, I had such a hard time um, to tell you the truth, looking some of my correctional officers in the eye because as, as an executive staff, we didn't really do a very good job, unfortunately, at preparing. We, we just kind of, um, because it was a crisis, plopped them all down there together. And so you would have a correctional officer with the, the person who maybe a couple months ago was on lockdown 23 hours a day, and then an offender that they didn't yet know was a dementia offender. So, so that's why that's part of our strategic plan, and we're trying to make that better. But um, you know, the correctional officers, their whole career have been told firm, fair, and consistent. Mm -hmm. And with this type of offender, you know what? That, that really doesn't work. Right. Programming. Have we not all been conditioned? You will get your GED. You will learn how to prepare sandwiches in the kitchen. You will get your vocational something. How many 80-year-olds want to get their GED? <laughs> How many 80-year-olds know what a GED is? So we, we step back and we say, OK, vocational, educational, vocational, educational. But when you're dealing with this population, you're programming. We have to think outside the box. And we have to go to that, what kind of programming makes sense for, for a, an 80-year-old? And who did we turn to? We turned to program administrators at nursing homes. What are your program objectives? We had to look at, guess what? Somebody may complete a program. One of the greatest things we did at Fort Lyon was we developed a restorative nursing therapy program. We, the facility was so rural, we couldn't get a physical therapist. So we implemented a restorative nursing therapy. As long as that offender attended the restorative therapy, which was whatever it was prescribed, two days a week, three days a week, five days a week, they got program credits because guess what? That was pertinent. That showed consistency. It showed their compliance, and it showed them doing something other than laying around watching Andy Griffith. But we have to look outside the box and see that programming for the aging offenders, programming for something to, with Huntington's Korea, programming for somebody that's got 
uh, in a hospice program for cancer is not going to look like programming for everybody else in the correctional system. It's not going to be educational or vocational. So we really turned to nursing homes, um, VA homes, local nursing homes, assisted living homes. Um, we even reached out to um, senior centers and said, what kind of programs do you have and do? And we brought those into the correctional environment. And lo and behold, that became the programming compliance that we needed for our elderly to be able to, to check that box. And last but not least, reentry. What are some of the things we worry about on reentry with an aging person? You think of a younger person, we worry about housing, job, and their bills. <laughs> well, with the aging, we worry about housing, food, how they got to eat. They're not necessarily going to be able to work. Medicare, how do we hook them up with their benefits? So looking at the reentry philosophy, it's not a one size fits all. It's not a cookie cutter. We can't do the same reentry program for the elderly that we do for the rest of the offender population. It's got to be customized to the needs of the generation. So those are some of the challenges that the Colorado Department of Corrections faced. Sorry, that was a long slide. <laughs> and some of those challenges go right into the, to the, um, the questions on here. Um, Colorado has um, a special needs parole where folks who maybe traditionally wouldn't be eligible for parole um, if they have a health condition or their age, it doesn't mean they are automatically paroled, but, um, but they, can be, um, they, they, they can go in front of the board. Um, so, so here's a question right here. Should we review sentencing and parole release to reduce the population of elderly offenders? You know, everything we've been talking about, and, and for those of us that, that have parents that, um, you know, are at that age, you know, that, the type of care that they're getting while they're incarcerated, it, it's really expensive. And, and, it, and the taxpayers are the ones that are paying for that. So, so that's a question, you know, do, do we consider, or do we, um, do we continue to spend tax dollars because the, all, all of these, um, caring for these folks really is expensive. So does it make more sense to, if we have the resources, um, introduce them back into community, um, have their family, um, Medicare, so somebody else paying for that? Um, I'm telling you from, from my facility, which does have the bulk of these folks, um, there's e even their families. You know, we've had offenders on hospice who, who could have gone. We had one recently who um, was actually eligible to go to a, a, a VA nursing home, and his family even even fought us, you know, that his, his crime was so heinous, even though he was, um, and he, he did pass away just a couple months ago, but um, it's, it's just not that easy to, um, to send those folks back out into the community. Um, these are difficult questions to answer, and there are many people on the, on the other side of the coin saying, but these people do not pose a threat to public safety, and as, as Kelly said, well, the the criminality doesn't right. doesn't necessarily right. disappear, right. but in, in some cases it may make sense to to release some of these prisoners um, under certain circumstances. Uh, there's a there's a program that's been operated out of um, one of the law schools for uh, a number of years called the Program for Older Prisoners, and um, the law students primarily work in this program, and they review cases very carefully. They go through all of their records to determine, you know, is this prisoner really a threat and does this person have some place to go? I mean, that's, as Kelly was just saying, just because you release them, that's not necessarily the most compassionate thing to do if they're going to be out on the street. So um, this program claims that they have a 0% recidivism rate for the prisoners that, whose cases they have reviewed. Um, and who have been released. So that's, the, that's a rate that nobody else can really match. But, you know, this is a very small number of prisoners that they've looked at. Uh, and another question here, should rehabilitative uh, programs be implemented for aging inmates? And Kelly talked a little bit about this already, about, you know, what programming actually makes sense once you get a lot older, um, and should we keep them in prison longer using the philosophy that, well, if, if they stay in longer, they're going to be fixed, they're going to be rehabilitated, and then we can let them out. I mean, that question really becomes moot the, the older that they get. So, um, and, and what about that handful 
we have that handful of offenders that are in their 60s and 70s that are committing crimes. Um, we actually just had one that came across my desk about a month ago that said, you know, I think he was 71 or 72, I don't remember how old he was, and he put in for special needs parole, and I, I looked and I was like, there's gotta be a typo. He's only, this says he's only been here three weeks. <laughs> and <laughs> it wasn't. Boy, he read that statute, you know, Senate Bill 176, and he said, hey, you know what, special needs parole. Um, but, but you know what, you still have to look at, if you can commit this crime at 72, then you know what, there's, there's going to be some kind of a commitment that there's gonna be a, a, a incarceration period that goes along with it. So we, we also look at that, look at the offenders that we have that are committing their crimes, they're coming in at six, in their 60s and 70s. And in our state, the district attorneys, the, the, the trying district attorneys also have a say in special needs paroles releases. So, you know, all that gets factored in. The, the district attorney, the victim, as well as the county, the community where they came from, and we wait for all of those components, and the parole board makes a very informed decision when they make those releases. So, again, we, we have some that they have receptive families, they have good parole plans, but again, that obligation, and, and I can't speak for the parole boards, but I've had those conversations with things that they considered, in looking at, again, the crime, what the crime is, what the time served was, and does the risk outweigh the benefit? You know, um, I, I, I can give you a perfect example. We had an offender who put in for a, a, a special needs parole. He was costing the state hundreds of thousands of dollars. He was a renal transplant. He was on dialysis. Um, we get this big sob story. You know, we, we, we know what we get from the time they come into the corrections forward. We can go further back, but when we're doing a special needs parole, we care about this frame of time. We did the package and sent it on to the parole board, and the parole board came back and said, did you know that he was on dialysis when he committed his heinous crime? You know, kibosh, squash, shabam. You know, it, I mean, there, I can, I, we can't argue that, but we did do due diligence in going through that process. So there's, there's many responses, good and bad, um, and that's what's, that's what's going to change. And that's what part of the evolution of managing our populations with the elderly and with our, our populations increasing and de decreasing is going to take into consideration what's the risk on society of that offender. We've had offenders that their mandatory release date, their MRD date comes up and no way. you know what? The family says, uh-uh, no way. You can't get a nursing home that'll take them. And so, you know what, but they're too sick to put out on the streets. You have, you have a humane obligation to make sure that you don't drop this guy off at the, at the bus stop with a bus ticket and don't know what happens to him. Um, and many times what we do is we collaborate with hospitals. We collaborate with hospitals because believe it or not, a hospital case manager with somebody who's no longer in inmate status can usually get a little bit further than a case manager from a prison on somebody who has an inmate status. Not to mention there's a certain dollar amount that appears a little bit better when they're not in inmate status, but you're absolutely correct, and, and that's huge. That's huge, but working with your local hospitals and saying, you know what, I mean, th this guy has central lines, or, or you know, my big one is those offenders that, that have um, um, deviated medication, be it Alzheimer's, be it sundowners, be it severe mental health, um, you know, but the mental health ones, we can do a direct commitment. We can do a direct commitment to a local hospital psych unit and then they, they process them. For the slide shows you the, the variety of ways that, that institutions are, are trying to deal with the aging population, whether it's dedicated units in prisons or separate prisons, separate medical facilities, secure nursing homes or hospice facilities. So uh, this, uh, this data is a, a little bit old right now, um, like the offenders they were serving. So um, this probably needs to be brought up to date somewhat. Mm -hmm. So in Colorado, since that's what we all know, um, like I said, the closing of Fort Lyon has really forced us to deal with this issue a little more. So what we've identified is some of the things that we need to do now that we no longer have a dedicated facility is um, with the facilities that we still do have, determine which, which beds are appropriate for this population. You know, how many are lower tier, lower bunk, big enough for wheelchairs? So, so we're working on that right now. 
We're going to develop a gap analysis to identify current projected resources and compare to those that are currently available. What do we have and what do we need? And again, these solutions, they can apply to a dedicated facility, they can apply to a unit or a pod, they can apply to, to, to a wing of a facility, but these are just some of the things that you'll need as you start to identify how you're going to manage these offenders. Um, we've mentioned it several times, the education and training, you know, not, not just to the, the correctional staff. Um, we need to work with our folks in community, ed educate our pre-release folks. Um, you know, we've, Renee and I talk all the time. We have a lot of folks in our department getting ready to retire. I'm one of them. And, and what, 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 a good, what a good opportunity there might be to open a private facility. I'm not going to do that. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but we've talked about for, for somebody, you know, there, there is an opportunity. So. Uh, developing assessment codes to identify the aging offenders by level of need. Just what we need, another code to identify them. We have their M code, we have their disability code, but you know what, we really need, we really need a code that's going to tell us what level of care do they need. Can they be in general population? Do they need our most restricted kind of ADA environment or is there somewhere in between? And that's something actually strategic planning in Colorado is working on right now is what does that assessment code look like? And, and then can we assign those levels of physical plant ability to facilities? So streamline that process so it's a matter of saying this prison can house this kind of offenders with these kinds of, of disabilities and this is how many beds we have. And one issue, I think, no matter what jurisdiction that we're in, you know, every day on the news, you hear how many of the fabulous baby boomers, you know, are, are turning 60 today, or how many are retiring. Um, the, the number of offenders that we have today with these issues, a year from now, five years from now, it, it's astronomical. Um, we, we just looked at those numbers as part of our um, strategic planning. I, I'm, I'm telling you, we need to get a plan in place today because this it's only the need is only going to increase again as we talked a little bit before the development and implementation of age appropriate programming education classes and jobs you know it's amazing that you can give an alzheimer's offender a basket of towels to fold and they will fold them better than you or i every time there's a job that we can have for everybody we used to wheel 20 aging offenders over to the library and tell them, get to, get to dust in the books. You know, we have to think outside the box. Everybody can't work in the kitchen. Everybody can't be a welder. Everybody can't do yard work. We need to be modifying our program and job assignments for the offenders' physical abilities. And again, by keeping them busy in that time and giving them those repetitive things that are going to intrigue them for their age abilities is going to make their time go by with less incidents. Um, we've talked about this a little bit, um, and, and to me this is one of the biggest challenges, at least in Colorado, is trying to establish contract agreements with local nursing homes. You know, it's just, it, it, it's almost impossible for us, at least at this point. You know, you have one bad experience. Um, even having worked in corrections for 25 years, both of my um, parents were in a nursing home a couple years ago, and I, I think even with, with my background and knowledge, you know, I, I'd have had some issues with that. And, and so, so educating folks on that and, and trying to come up with a good alternative. And one of the things that Colorado has done recently is what we call the IRS, the Interdepartmental Reentry Steering Committee. And that's where we have actually partnered with um, our, um, our Department of Housing to look at some other potential housing opportunities. Do we have an opportunity to have a building that's going to house sex offenders, that's going to house um, some assisted living? Do we have an ability to have some maybe some on-site nursing assistance that can give that, that higher level of need in, in a living environment? That's the only way right now, absent of nursing homes that want to take those offenders that have these felony convictions and have these crimes behind them, is working collaboratively with other state agencies to see what can be developed with either grant dollars or, or housing development dollars. That's one of the things that, that, that we're actually working on very diligently right now. In closing, you know, and, and we thank you guys. This is a very, very hot topic. The aging population is, as Ray said, it's something that's, that's coming. With the aging of the baby boomer generation and the veterans generation, um, this is something that we're not going to slow down. We're not going to stop. And if it's not the baby boomers and the veterans that are inside our, or, inside our organization right now, 
it's the new offenders that are coming in that are in their 60s and 70s and you know what maybe even some in their 80s but this is something that we're going to have to address responsibly um, there are many concerns related to successful reentry for those that are leaving corrections I encourage you to use the resources that are available to us think about the things that you would expect to see your grandparent or your aging aunt or your aging uncle or what would they be doing if they were leaving prison? What would they need? Again, do they need to worry so much about a job? Not so much. They need that Medicare component. They need that Meals on Wheels component, hooking up those resources that are going to make sure that these people have the, the daily viable needs to, to go on, to continue. And again, that's their home, their clothing, their health care, and their, their, their food, Meals on Wheels. And then successful management of the population. It's, again, working with nursing homes. Um, and even if we go to nursing homes, I've had many discussions with nursing homes where I asked them for a bed. They said no. I said, okay, can I talk to you about what programs I can take back to corrections to make a more humane living environment for the time that these people are going to be under our incarceration? And you know what? You would be surprised. I've actually had people that were willing to come out and look and say, hey, you know what? You can do fine motor dexterity. Let's buy six Rubik's cubes. You know, you give five Alzheimer's patients Rubik's Cubes and you're golden for about two hours. <laughs> so, you know, look at some of those external resources in your community and when you have those collaborative, when you have those collaborative relationships, we're, we're one way or another, until we find an absolute disposition for them after corrections, we're going to have a good way to manage them while they're inside. We appreciate you coming this afternoon and, and please feel free to reach out to any of us. All right, thank you.